Welcome to Gower Society Youth, funded by the Gower Society. Now this activity is a virtual activity. We're going to do virtual rock pooling. If you're going rock pooling, you need to be safe. You can't go rock pooling at any point in the day. You have to be aware of the tide. And it's best to go rock pooling during your lowest tide. However, it's quite useful to go an hour or so before low tide, and that way you can follow the tide out. So if we start here, we are actually quite close to high tide here, but it's going out. So that means we know we can always safely walk back to shore. For the next four or so hours, we are safe on the shore. It also means that as we walk further out and the tide goes out, we're following it. All the animals that get stranded in our rock pools have only just been stranded. So we've got a greater chance of seeing a higher variety of animals before they realise they're stranded and start heading their way back towards the sea. So following the tide out is always a good idea. So if you want to go rock pooling for a few hours, then come a few hours after high tide, follow it out. You've got then another three hours or so or four to follow the tide out before there's any chance of it coming back in. If you do start rock pooling at low tide or any time after that, it's really important for you to notice what the sea is doing. Now the sea is going to be coming in, but it's not going to come in on a straight line. Because there's lots of inlets and lots of bits that stick out, so you must be aware of what's going on around you. If you're not watching, then bits like this inlet can get filled up and you can get, have water on you from either side and you're quite dry, but actually you end up being stranded and surrounded by water, which means you can't make your way back to the shore safely. So it's really important when you're rock pooling to keep half an eye on the tide, not just so that your feet are staying dry, because it's obvious when you're going to get wet feet, but also so that surrounding you is not a lot of water which actually cuts you off from your exit point. So always watch the tide and watch your way out. Make sure you can always walk out. Even people who live by the beaches and are rock pooling all the time can get stranded if they get too engrossed in what they're doing in the rock pooling and ignore the fact that the tide is actually surrounding them. It's just not your feet getting wet that's going to be a danger, but the water cutting you off from the mainland. I want to take you on a little journey, so just sit comfortably, but I want you to imagine that you're sitting on a rock, and your rock is on the side of the beach. It's in the rocky shore, and you're sitting in a rock pool. Now you are completely covered in water and it's a freezing cold water. But that's fine because you're a rock pool animal. So you can breathe underwater, you can move underwater and you can feed and you are very happy. But suddenly the water starts disappearing and your head is being exposed to the air and you have to take a great big deep breath because you can't breathe in the air and then your shoulders are now in the air and then your body and your legs until you're all completely exposed to the air <gasps> and it's starting to get warm. The sun is beating down on you and you're starting to dry up and you're feeling so thirsty and you can't walk and you can't eat and then you hear a sound. It's a squawking sound. And something comes down and starts pecking at you and trying to pull you off the rock. And you're holding on to the rock as hard as you can so you don't get eaten. And then in the background you hear a new sound. It's a roaring sound. And it gets louder and louder until suddenly there's a great big crash and you're knocked away and you hold on tight to the rock so it the wave doesn't wash you off and then suddenly you can breathe again and it's lovely and cold and you're covered in water again but then it disappears again and you're out in the air and you have to hold your breath then another wave comes crashing on top of you trying to knock you off your rock and you hold on as tight as you can and then slowly your legs start to get covered in water then your body then your shoulders then your head until you're completely submerged again and then you can breathe again and you can move and you can feed and you're happy and contented until the tide goes out 
again. Now that's what it feels like to live in the rocky shore in a rock pool. What do you think? Is that an easy place to live? Would you like to live in a rock pool? Now we're going to explore the rock pools and see if we can actually find anything living in that really difficult place. So when you're looking for animals underneath rocks, carefully lift them, not, make sure they're not too big for you, and just balance them on the edge and hold them still there. Then look underneath in the water and see if you can see anything moving around. There may be a fish there, there may be a crab, there may not be anything there at all, but just let it settle for a bit and then watch and see if anything moves. But don't forget to look underneath the surface of the rock as well because there are lots of animals that hold on to the rocks. So make sure that you're looking at those. Look, we've got a variety of winkles here, different textures, different colours and shapes. And if when you go rock pooling, you're only looking at the animals in the water, the fish and the crabs, you're going to miss a whole range of amazing animals that are living attached to the rock and hiding. Now you can see they're all starting to move now and they're not very comfortable here. So they need to be underneath the water in order for them to breathe. So they've got gills, but they're not going to survive very long outside of the water because they're going to dry out. So when I finish with my rock, I need to make sure that I place it back very carefully and let the animals go back underwater that were underwater before. Under the rock might also be the home to many animals and you need to make sure that you put the roof back on their house. So that should be every single stone you pick up place it back where you found it. And if you find any animals and you want to collect them and put them in a pot so you can look at them in detail, make sure you put them back where you found them as well. They are in a special part of the shore for a reason. If you relocate them to a different part, they may not be able to survive. This is the splash zone. Now it isn't officially part of the littoral area, so the rocky shore, because it never gets completely inundated by salty water. So it's up above the high tide mark, so you can see that by the strand line. But when you've got stormy weather or when the waves are coming in quite fast, it will get splattered with salt water, so you won't find any terrestrial plants or anything that can survive here. So it's a very harsh environment. So it's neither marine or terrestrial really, but there are some very distinguishing features on it. The two main organisms that you'll find in this splash zone are both lichens. Now a lichen isn't a plant and it isn't an animal. It's a symbiotic relationship between a mushroom and an algae. And most of these have got a large proportion of mushroom and a small proportion of algae. So they're not green in colour. Now the two that we've got here, we've got one that is a really good marker of where the highest point in the tide ever actually gets. And that's this oil lichen here. It's not oily, it's very flat. It's what we call a crustiose lichen, so it doesn't stick out very much. But you can see it making like a slick shape along here. And some people get worried when they see it, especially in Pembroke, because they think that it's an oil slick, but in fact it's not. It's a natural part of the succession in the zonation here in the littoral zone. We've also got this yellow crustiose lichen here as well. And this lichen here is a very distinguishing one for our splash zone. You can see it rises up all the way to the areas in the rock here above the high tide mark and this one here is so full of mushroom it's about 97% mushroom and only 3% algae and the actual colour of it changes depending on how exposed the environment is so if it needs to get a lot of sunlight then you might see it's, got, it's a brighter orangey colour and if it's got less then it might be a more brown colour so you get a big variety of colours in this yellow lichen. As we move further away from our splash zone and closer towards the sea, we get to the upper shore. Now this is part of the littoral zone. This is part of our rocky shore and it's a marine environment. Even though this upper shore is only covered by the tide for about 20% of the time. And that varies depending on whereabouts in that zone you are. So if you're very close to the splash zone, you may be only covered in, in water from the very highest tides, which is once a month, for maybe just an hour or so, maybe even a few minutes. So you don't find a lot of marine organisms up there, especially animals, because they won't be able to cope with that. If you come further down through the upper shore, 
and you're still within the upper shore, the further you get towards the sea, the more and more you will find green animals and marine plants. And we've got an indicator here that we're in the upper shore. This is our channel rack. So this is our brown seaweed. And if you look, it's bent over and it's got channels in between the fronds here. So this is our channel rack. And this is an indicator that we are low down in the upper shore. We're near the bottom end of the upper shore. Now around here you might find some rock pools, but most of the material here is not, well, it's quite loose, so it's not creating many rock pools. If you do find rock pools in the upper shore, they are not going to be very high in the number of animals they have living there or in plants. That's because the conditions within these rock pools are very harsh. Now these rock pools in the upper shore are being exposed to the air for 80% of the time which means that the conditions are very harsh here. When that sun comes out, it will evaporate lots of the water, so the size of the rock pool will actually reduce as the day goes on. And not only will the amount of water go down, the salt inside it will become more concentrated, so we end up with a super saline rock pool. Also, the temperature of the water will also increase, and as it increases, it's less likely to hold on to oxygen. So we have a high temperature, high salinity, low oxygen environment, which is very difficult to live in. Any animals that live here, therefore, have to be adapted to be able to survive. Not only do they have to be able to cope with the extreme changes in temperature, salinity and oxygen levels, they also are being exposed to predators, like birds that can come in and start eating them. So they must be able to hide or protect themselves from being eaten. Because this rock pool may not be inundated until once every month or so, it means that any food source that's in the water, such as the plankton, doesn't get replaced for quite a long time. So the amount of food available to any filter feeders in this rock pool is much less than lower down the shore when they get covered in water quite a few times in the month. We found our first rock pools, but they're not going to be very productive and they're going to be quite a difficult place to live in. In the upper shore and the middle shore, the majority of animals that survive there and successfully have got a shell on them. Now these shells protect them from desiccation, which means drying out in the sun. So if you pick up these from the rocks, you'll find that underneath they have oh, come, an operculum. This is a half circle piece of hard material that helps them to trap a bubble of water between them and the rock itself. And it means that even if the tide goes out and they're left high and dry, like these ones are, they still have a bubble of water that they can use to slowly stay alive through the desiccation so they can breathe in through that water and they can also keep it from them drying out their soft parts also means this hard shell here will protect them from predators because they're being exposed not only to harsh conditions such as the sun and the drying power of the wind, they're also going to be exposed to predators. So this hard shell is going to protect them from that. So what we've got is winkles. Now winkles, there's lots of varieties of winkles. You've got little periwinkles, You've also got our uh, smooth winkles, you've got rough winkles, you've got flat winkles, you've got edible winkles, whole load of sea snails. We're now in the middle shore, so we've come down from the upper shore and we're closer to the sea. So the middle shore is not as harsh as the upper shore. It's inundated every day and the, most of that area will be inundated half of the day. So there's a lot of salt water conditions here which are similar to when the tide's in. You get a lot more of the rock pools and a lot more animals can survive here because they don't have to be so well adapted to survive outside of the water. Now the way you can tell that we are in the middle shore and not in the upper shore anymore is by the type of seaweed. So we've got here some serrated rack. You can see the zigzags along the edges. This is a serrated rack. This is an indicator of the middle shore. And all around us here, we've got this other rack here, this other seaweed, and it's called spiral rack. Can you see the way the fronds are spiraling there? So loads of spiral rack here, very different from our channel rack. And if you look to the left, 
there, that dark black stuff, that's our channel wrap. You can see we're switching zones and this greener one, this is our, our spiral wrap. So they are very distinct zones, but it's not necessarily a significant distance between each one. So I can't say it's 50 metres or 20 metres because it depends on your tidal range. It also depends on the animals and plants. So the zone, we say the zone is where those certain animals and plants are, not necessarily where the distance is from the tide line or from the low tide line. So this area here has got a lot more water, a lot more conditions which are similar to the sea, so we find less adapted animals than we did in our upper shore, but we do find a greater variety. Limpets can be found in the middle shore and sometimes even in the upper shore because they're perfectly adapted to hold on to the rock. So they hold on tight when the tide goes out and they trap this layer of water underneath their shell so that they can still breathe when the tide has gone out. But if they get knocked off the rock and they're exposed, then they will die because they won't be able to survive and they will desiccate. Limpets are herbivores and they have this amazing radula, which is like a water wheel with teeth on the outside. And when the tide is in, what they do is they crawl around the rock, grazing on this tiny film of algae that's on the surface there. And they move themselves left and right and cover the rock. And sometimes you can see the, the scar of the radula as it moves along the rock. But when the tide is coming out, going out again, they will always return to where they started out and they always have this depression where they started. Sometimes you can find this limpet scar where one of the limpets have worn away the space every time it's come back when the tide's gone out, but it's this one's been removed. Either it's been eaten or it's been pushed, uh, it's been taken off the rock and you can see the scar it's left behind. The animals you'll find an awful lot of in the upper shore and in the middle shore and also in the lower shore are barnacles. Now these are acorn barnacles. Barnacles have an amazing life cycle. They spend a lot of their time in the plankton as youngsters and then one day they find their way to the rocky shore and they find a rock like this one and they do a handstand and they stick their head to the rock and then they stick their head with the, one of the best glues in the world. In fact, dentists have been looking at the glue that they use to stick their heads onto the rocks for many years to see if they can replicate it. They then stay in this location for the rest of their lives. As the tide goes out, they're very well adapted to survive because they have this very hard case around them. So they build themselves a nice home which is protected. They stuck down fast so even when the waves come crashing in, they don't get washed away. They also don't get attacked by birds because they're so hard to open but if you look at them they've got this line in the middle and when the tide comes in they open that up and they shove their feet out into the current and they catch all the plankton which they then bring in and eat them. So using their feet to eat is quite a unique way of eating but it's a lot easier to do when you're standing on your head. Now if you find some which don't have those that line in the middle then these ones are empty and these ones have died. So, but they can be here for quite a long time. Sometimes they actually go onto places that are mobile. So you can find them on crabs or on winkles or dog whelks or even on whales. So barnacles, although they are sedentary, they're stuck to something, they could move if the thing they're stuck to isn't sedentary. Also found in the middle shore, are anemones and this is a beadlet anemone. Now they look like blobs of brown jelly and if you touch them you might see their tentacles. See the tentacles have just gone inside. But if you find them on the sides of the rock pools outside of the water they'll have no tentacles but then you'll come out when the tide comes in. If you find them inside the rock pools then their tentacles will be out. These look quite different from the snake locks and enemies that you only find in the lower shore, whose tentacles can't be retracted. And they've got a greeny tinge and they're less red, more pinky. 
So here this beadle anemone is inside a rock pool, so its tentacles are out. And if I put my finger close to these tentacles, you'll see that it actually sticks to my finger. You can see that sticking to me. And what it's actually doing is firing tiny little harpoons. And if I was a small fish or a shrimp, then that would harpoons would be enough to paralyze me and then it would draw me in with its tentacles and start to eat me. And the mouth is right in the middle of these 192 tentacles, which is also its bottom. However, because my skin is so thick, when the nematocytes hit me from the tentacles, they just bounce back again, and that's when I feel this stickiness. But if I had thinner skin, then I might be paralysed and that would be me. But if you manage to go to the rocky shore, you could bring some dog food and place it just next to these tentacles and then watch the, the bead little enemy pull in the tentacles and pull in the dog food and have a feed. So if you look back from where we've come from, there we've got the splash zone up there and the upper shore, the middle shore. And as we get closer to the sea, we are now in the furthest extent, which is the lower shore. Now the lower shore is only exposed for maximum of 20% of the time and during the month in your neap tides it's sometimes not exposed at all. So the conditions here are less harsh because you're usually under the water when you're living here. There's always an awful lot of rock pools and these rock pools are going to have the same salinity as that of the sea so they don't evaporate very much and they don't change in temperature much. So very similar to the conditions in the marine environment. And that means that we have a huge amount of marine biodiversity here. And if you look at the seaweed, we can tell we're in the lower shore by the species we've got. So we've got some green seaweeds. We've got some sea lettuce here. This is telling us we're in the lower shore. And this red one is dulse. This tells us we're also in the lower shore. And if you manage to go out of the lower shore and carry on into the sublittoral zone, you sometimes see kelp. You can either see it floating around, or if you can wade out carefully, you can see that large leathery seaweed in the sublittoral zone. Now this mollusk here, this sea snail, looks a bit like a winkle, but because we're in the lower shore, it's not. This is actually a carnivorous sea snail. This is a dog whelk. And if I lift him up here, you can see how to identify him. See that groove there going from the operculum out to the side? That means that this is a dog whelk. And dog whelks are carnivores. Now these are actually the only animal on the rocky shore that can actually get their way into the other shelled animals. Now they don't prise it open. In fact, they have a radula just like the limpets, but it's been adapted to turn into a drill. So what they do is they cling on to the outside of something like a limpet or a mussel and they actually start to drill through that shell. And this could take something up to a week. And as they drill through it with their radula, they also secrete a chemical which actually weakens the shell and starts to dissolve it. And then once they're through, they then put in some digestive enzymes and they turn the inside into a soup. Then they suck it up and they have their dinner and then off they go. Now although they're not suckered on very tight, they're very easy to pull off, they can't be pulled off with something without arms. But if I actually got this dog whelk and I put it on you, it could actually drill through your skull. But all you'd have to do is just flick it off. So if you find any shells with holes on, on the beach, then they've probably been eaten by a dog whelk. So I'm going to put this back where I found it. There he goes. Dog whelks come in an amazing array of colours as well. They could be yellow, they can have stripes on them along their bands, they could be covered in barnacles. And you can always tell by that groove underneath. You can also find their eggs clinging onto the underside of rocks. They're kind of vase shaped and bright pink. The other mollusk or sea snail that you'll find in the lower shore is the top shell with these beautiful mother of pearl colours. 
they've also got the same colours inside their shells. Now there's a huge variety of top shells. You've got grey top shells, you've got painted top shells, and you've got purple top shell. But they're much less adapted to changes in temperature, so they've got to be in the lower shore. Here in the lower shore, we have the other sea anemone. This is a snake lock sea anemone. And if you look at their tentacles, you can see why they're called that, because they look like snakes, a bit like Medusa, which is actually the Latin name for it. Now these can't be retracted as easily, so they need to be located in rock pools and usually in the lower shore. And if you see, there's a greenish tinge to their tentacles, and that's because they have a symbiotic relationship with an algae, a bit like the lichen that we saw in this splash zone. So again, you can feed these, and they will bring the food into mouth slash bottom, and you can see how long it takes for them to eat a little bit of food. Now these can actually reproduce by budding, which means they just split themselves in half and make a clone. On the lower shore, which is only exposed to the air for a small number of hours in the day, you'll find some incredible creatures. This here is an echinoderm. This is a common sea urchin, and you have to go out when it's very low tide to see these. They tend to munch their way along the sea floor, eating away the algae that's on the rocks there. And you can see these spines over its back, and these are to protect it. But underneath it, a bit like a starfish, it's got lots and lots of tube feet which allow it to move along the rocks. Now these go to about the size of a small cushion that you get like that, a bit like my fingers there. And they go around in herds sometimes and they can absolutely obliterate the area and taking away all of the algae. But I'm not going to try and take him off the rock because that will damage him and also might damage my fingers. Also down on the lower shore, we've got a nice selection of crabs. Now shore crabs are found in all parts of the, sh of the shore, but if you look in the lower shore, you'll find this one. If you look on the edge, its edge looks a bit like the crust of a pasty. And they're quite red in colour, although this one is quite mottled. They have black ends to their claws, and usually when you lift them up, they don't try and attack you, and they actually pull their legs in so that they're trying to pretend that you're a rock, they're a rock or something. They also put their back legs out like this one are, is, and they track themselves in between two rocks. So if you look in rock crevices, you'll find these edible crabs. Now this edible crab is a female and she is in berry. She has actually got her eggs underneath her. So those eggs there, those purple eggs there, each tiny little blob is a going to be a baby crab. And so there's an awful lot there. Now those will be released into the water and will go into the plankton, but they won't look like baby crabs. They've got lots of different stages before they look anything like a crab. And those stages are all called instars. So each time it actually metamorphoses into a different shape and it goes like a star and it goes into another weird shapes. And all the time it will be in the plankton there eating up the zooplankton. Now when it's turned into its last instar. After its fifth stage, it will turn into what you think of as a little crab, and it will be more crab-shaped. And then it will start to settle and actually live in the rocky shore itself, walking along the shorebed and no longer being along the plankton. This crab here, also only found in the lower shore, is a porcelain crab and they're always found underneath rocks and they're very squat, they're very flat and that's so that they can hide underneath the rocks. You lift up the rocks and they can still be attached to it. Very flat and also they have lots of like fluffy edges so they're very well camouflaged because they actually blend into the background. This one's actually got a keel worm on its claws and its claws are very flat and very large but again, it's not something that's going to pinch you, but it's going to be trying to scavenge for, hunt, for food inside the rock pools with those big claws. Now this edible crab here is actually soft. So it's got a very soft shell at the moment, and that means it's very vulnerable. The reason it's got a soft shell is because it used to live inside this shell. So as animals grow bigger, usually their skeletons grow bigger with them, 
But exoskeleton creatures like crustaceans, like crabs and lobsters, and also lots of invertebrates, do not grow bigger skeletons as they get bigger. So after a while they get too big for their skeletons. So this crab here was living inside this little crab skeleton. And then it got too big for it, so probably a few hours ago, if not less than that, it actually popped open the back of its skeleton, pulled its legs out, pulled out everything, its eyes, left its gills behind, and came out as this soft skeleton. Of course, this crab couldn't possibly live inside here with that hard skeleton that size. So that soft skeleton is now filled out and it will sit in a quiet place, protecting itself because it's very vulnerable. And then once it's hardened in the air, then it will be able to carry on life. And it's left this skeleton behind. If you find what you would think is a dead crab on the beach and you want to tell if it's a molt, so an old skeleton or just a dead crab, you can look at its eyes. So if you look at a crab's eyes, they're usually dark, usually black. And that crab there has got black eyes. However, if you look at the molt, look up close, they're usually white or opaque. You can see through them. And that's because the crab has taken its eyes with it. And therefore those eyes are just empty eye sockets and therefore there's nothing inside them. Also, if you look underneath, we can tell if it's a boy or a girl. It's a lot easier to tell with, an ed uh, with a shore crab. So we'll go and find a shore crab to tell which is which. But if you see this crab here, not trying to defend itself, but trying to crawl up into a ball so that we don't hurt it. And because it's a peeler, because it is soft, it is very vulnerable. So we're going to put it back very carefully so he doesn't get eaten by any birds. Here we have a shore crab. Different from the edible crab, because if you look at the edge of its carapace, it's got a spiky edge to its carapace, not that pie crust that we saw with the edible crab. Now this one I found in the lower shore, but these can also be found in the middle shore, sometimes even the upper shore, whereas the edibles are only found in the lower shore. Now remember I said about the tail? So if I turn this over, its tail is tucked underneath here. We can see that it's broader at the bottom than at the top and it's not a triangle, it's not a sharp triangle, it's more like a half circle and that makes this a female. And we can also see because she's in berry again. So she's got all those eggs, so every single one of those tiny orange grains is a tiny little crab baby or will be when it hatches out into the plankton. So I'm going to carefully put her back where I found her because she's going to want to let go of all of her children soon. So this is the shore crab. In fact, she goes under her stone and I'm gonna very carefully put the lid back on her house. And you can see here a shore crab actually molting and coming out of its exoskeleton. So it's quite squished. You can see it's quite soft there. And then once it's completely out, it needs to then inflate itself and harden off in the sun. Another crab found on the lower shore is the velvet swimming crab. Now these crabs are pretty vicious. So if I try to pick him up, you can see he's going for me and they give quite a nasty pinch. Very different from the shore crabs and from the edible crabs. They have got a furry back and if you do stroke it very carefully without going near its pincers, it does feel like velvet. They also have these amazing bright red eyes. And because they're a swimming crab, their back legs are adapted to actually float through the water. I wouldn't ever call it swimming, but they're flattened to be like paddles so that when they fall through the water, then they will slow their descent. They can't really swim. And these are really vicious and they will attack things in the rock pool. They are probably quite like a top predator in this area. I'm gonna try and pick him up. Okay, so just so you can see how, <laughs> I'm scared now, aggressive these can be. Actually, pass me the net. I'll do this in stones. Okay, mister, that's very gentle. Oh, put him into the net. Thank you. 
There we go. So when you're picking up a crab, especially a velvet swimming crab, you need to push down on the back. If it's soft, I suggest you don't pick him up, leave him alone. But this one isn't a peeler, so he's not soft, so I can press him down. That pushes the legs squashed against the ground, so he can't lift them up, so therefore he can't get his pincers out, and then he won't be able to pinch me or move away. Then wiggle your fingers until they're behind his pincers. It's like somebody trying to touch you in the middle of your back. It's very hard for you to touch them. Now, they might squash your fingers in between their carapace, which is the back here, and their legs or their pincers, but if you're very careful, you can lift them up. And hopefully when you pick them up, they do start to calm down. Try and get a good hold. And there we go. So if you look underneath, we have a big triangle here. So this is the tail of the uh, crab. If you imagine a lobster, the tail sticks down here. With the crab, they tuck it underneath. And as you saw with the edible crab, if it's a female, it holds on to the, all of the eggs underneath there. So it needs to be very broad underneath and in a half circle. The males don't have to do that, so they just have this triangle, very sharp, acute triangle. So this triangle here shows that this is a male. You can see these lovely flattened back legs for swimming. And of course, we've got the crab's got 10 legs, six legs for walking, the two back legs for swimming, and the two pincers. Pincing, which is usually for eating. They can attack with them, but usually it's just for scavenging and finding food. And then if you look at the front, we've got our antennae, which is sticking down at the moment, but they'll be for detecting what's around. And also, if you watch them, they will open these that look like doors. They're their mandibles. So they'll open up and inside they'll have their other feeding um, mandibles as well. So absolutely stunning. Got these lovely black stripes down their legs. Very distinct from any shore crab or any of the other crabs. So if I put him down, you'll probably see him trying to have a go at me, trying to give me a pinch. But he's actually quite calm now, isn't he? So let's put him down there and see... Oh, let's see. He's quite calm now. And off he goes. Stunning. Here are three prawns. Now, the way you tell the difference between a prawn and a shrimp, if you look at the front legs of these, you will see that they have got claws on them. They also crawl around, whereas the shrimps, if you find shrimp in the rock pool, they're usually very see-through and they tend to jump and scuttle around, not crawl. But they both have 10 pairs of legs and these very long double pair of antennae. This beautiful fish here is a pipefish and this one's actually a worm of pipefish. Now they're related to the seahorses but they have no curled up tail. So it looks like a seahorse that's had its tail straightened out. He's only got one fin, the dorsal fin down its back, and it's so light, it only just can see it there. And he doesn't even have any pectoral fins at the front to direct him. He's got this tiny little snout at the front, which is a little upturned, so it's a little pug nose. And this he uses for catching tiny bits of plankton in the water. They live in amongst the seaweed and use their prehensile tail to hold themselves there. They live down in the lower shore, and they're quite often missed even though they're quite common down there, underneath rocks and in seaweed. This is one of the many worms that you find living in the rocky shore. This is a honeycomb worm. And if you look carefully, you can see that the honeycomb worm has stuck together sand grains to create these hexagonal tubes. Inside each one of these tubes, there is a honeycomb worm, which will only come out when the tide is in and they're covered out. There's another worm here. Can you see it? This is the sand mason worm. It's also made itself a case, but this time not out of sand, but out of tiny grains of gel fragments and small little stones. And you can see this feathery bit at the top. So it sits inside its tube. It's probably way down now because the tide's out. But when the tide comes in, these feathery bits here will catch the plankton as it gets washed past by the tide. And then it will feed on those when the tide is in. So both of these are filter feeders relying on the tide to bring in their food every time the tide comes in. 
another worm you might find on the sh rocky shore is attached to the rocks and it's so hard made up of the cemented tube and living inside each of these cemented tubes is a keel worm and they usually have a triangular tube now these keel worms are really tough and sometimes they actually put their tubes on the underside of boats and they have to be scraped off you rarely see the actual worm which comes out only when the tide is in to feed. I hope you enjoyed our latest Gower Society Youth virtual activity and if you're going to go off to your local beach and go and visit there and try and see the animals that I've showed you today then why don't you look at the Gower Society website Look at the Young Explorers page and you'll find some ID guides for rock pool animals. There's also one for seaside animals as well. If you'd also like to join the Gower Society, you can find a membership form there and then you can help them because they're going to be funding our Gower Society Youth Activities and the Nature Days online activities. If you'd like some more outdoor activities or you'd like this film, then please do subscribe to the Nature Days YouTube channel and have a look at the Gower Society Youth Facebook page so that you can keep be kept informed of our next activity. So we're going to have another virtual, or it could be a real, depending on the regulations, whether they've been reduced, next month, so our next activity. But in the meantime, if you want some other outdoor activities and some more challenges, subscribe to the Nature Day YouTube channel and then you'll get every day you'll get a new challenge that will do outdoor activities and will help you enjoy being outside and also learning lots about nature and also some science as well. And if there's any teachers out there who would like some help with resources of doing outdoor learning, Nature Days has also created some outdoor learning cards which you can purchase from Nature Days and please contact if you want some help with getting back to school and getting your children doing some outdoor learning. If you do find any interesting creatures when you go rock pooling yourself, then I'd love to see them. And if you'd like me to identify them, then please do tweet them on Twitter, hashtag Nature Days, or at Dawn Nature Days, or at Gower Society, and we can all share and see what you find when you go to your local beach. So, if you've got any questions, go rock pooling, or if you see anything exciting, then please share it with the Gower Society youth community. So tweet or put on the Facebook page. And please stay safe out there, enjoy your rock pooling, and I hope you have good fun.